So materials and ignore fall 2018. So when you're building the building, you're specifying the specific materials, but you want to know what materials you're putting into a building. Um, we're going to talk about the characteristics of common building materials, their sustainability, which is a huge piece that you should be always thinking of, um, material and design issues, and general design guidelines. <clears throat> so things to think about with your materials are the source. Is it naturally occurring? So what would be a naturally occurring material that you would use in um, your building? What? You just say that again. Sorry, wood. when wood, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then if we're, so you want to think about naturally occurring. Steel is not naturally occurring, right? Brick is not. Adobe, you might consider naturally occurring, but wood is definitely one. Most building materials are not naturally occurring. What about renewable versus non renewable? What's a renewable material that you could use in a building? Any ideas? Renewable means that, what does renewable mean? Uh, that it can generate itself again? Yes, exactly. So think, what is a material that you would use that could generate itself again? I don't, I'm drawing a blank. Same material, wood. Oh, Timber. okay. Tim, okay. Tim, yeah. But what you want to do when you do wood, and I think it's in this slide set, is you want to get wood that is FSC certified. So they certify that for every tree that's taken down, I think they plant two. So there's always new trees growing for people to use. Non-renewable means I, there's nothing I can do that that it is not uh, renewable. So that's most of the manufactured pieces, um, be, unless they can be recycled. So then you want to also think about the processing and production. You want to think about the, the toxicity in, in both processing and production. Embodying energy, does anybody know what embodying energy means? Not sure if Dan's gotten to that in his class yet. So embodied energy is the energy that it takes to manufacture and deliver a material to the job site. So it's the energy that goes into getting that material made into your job site. And then everyone knows what recyclable and reusable are. <clears throat> so what's a what's something from a building that would be recyclable? Glass. Gla uh, yeah, glass, yep. What else? Can you use steel? You steel can be recycled. Aluminum Definitely. Aluminum and concrete can now. Concrete's a fairly new recycled. Aluminum's like one of the best <clears throat> recyclable materials. It can be recycled over and over forever. Um, so I was at a field trip with a, another group from Renewable Energy, and they had pizza for lunch, and they had cans of pops, and they threw all their cans in the garbage can. So I'm dumpster diving in the garbage can because they're all, you know, this is a Renewable Energy group. They're all Every time I see a can go into the garbage, it makes me upset because that is totally recyclable and it will never biodegrade in the ground. So reusable, what's a reusable material that you could have from a job site? And this is gonna feed into an assignment I'm gonna give you guys. I would say wood, maybe you can cut it down for different dimensions or? You can you reuse wood, what else? Bricks, those are easy ones. Okay, and then issues and limitations. Um, I'm gonna skip that for right now. So why are we talking about materials? Because we're using the Earth's materials almost twice as fast as the, their ability to renew themselves. And the United States is the worst offender. Um, China's coming up close. But the United States per capita, China's coming up close, but they have a lot more population. We are the worst per capita use, users of materials in the world. 
So we need to rethink how we do our buildings. And what's the easiest way to, um, what's the best way to save resources when you're building a new building? If you have to build a new building, what's the best way to save resources? Would it be to use about, recycled materials? You can use recycled materials. But even better than that is build small. So don't build anything you don't need. I'm, I want to do a PowerPoint on um, residential houses because our house size used to be, the average house size, I think in the 50s, was 1,200 square feet. And people had big families back then, four or five kids, average. And now the average size is like 25, 2,700 square feet, and people have 1.2 kids. So we're, you know, being conscious and thinking about different uses. So embodied energy, as we talked about earlier, is the total energy required for extraction, processing, manufacture, and delivery to the building site. So energy consumption produces CO2. CO2 is what is giving us the greenhouse gas emissions, which is melting our polar ice caps, changing our, um, changing our weather patterns, and it's directly responsible for the horrific fires in California right now, and that happened in Australia in the past couple of years. So it's a really um, important thing. So if you can reduce the embodied energy, whether it be in the manufacture or the delivery, you've reduced your COT consumption. So each, each building that you built has embodied energy in it. How much energy did it take to build that building? So a renewable resource is something that can be replenished at the same or less amount of time. One of the best renewable resources, and it's a really great building material, is bamboo. Because bamboo is rapidly growing, it's a strong material, and it can be replaced um, very quickly. So rapidly renewable materials have a harvest cycles under 10 years, that's a bamboo. Non-petroleum based. Petroleum is not a renewable resource. When we dig that last gallon of oil out of the earth, that's it. It's not going to come back again um, unless we have another ice age and, and we all become the petroleum in the future because the petroleum is really from the ice age and the dinosaurs. Then we have construction and demolition waste. Uh, it's called C&D waste. It's non-hazardous, uh, non-contaminated waste that you take apart and you're going to reuse. We already talked about bricks concrete, uh, rock. You know, if you come in late, I need you to go in the other room. Uh, rock and other masonry materials. Wood, including non-hazardous paint, can be reused. Scrap metal, plaster, and gypsum drywall can be reused. Plumbing fixtures and piping. Insulation that doesn't have asbestos in it. Roofing shingles. Asphalt pavement, glass and plastic, landscape waste. So more things than you think. Has anybody heard of uh, Reuse Depot? Um, yeah, Reuse Depot in Maywood. Well, you're going to know about it because that's going to be your assignment. So let's see. Different types of recycling. We have single stream. So that's... Um, where you put just the cardboard in one bin, or all recyclables, including cardboard, aluminum, plastic, are placed in the same bin. So that's what we do in the alley off of our house, and we put it, uh, send it out to the recycling facility. It used to be that you had to sort, or sort se separation, which is the one below, and you had to have a different bin for each thing. So we had a bin for glass and metal, and then we had to put our paper in bags. And so we had to separate it out and they sorted it. The collection costs are higher for that, but the processing costs are lower. Um, there's some great videos. I'll try to find one on single stream resources, all the, the machinery that uses it. Um, we've been led to believe that we can recycle plastic. That's a fallacy. The plastic is not getting recycled. It's going into the garbage. The way we were recycling it for many years was we were shipping it to China. China put a moratorium on that 
a couple of years ago. So then we started going to other third world countries and they have all said, we don't want America's waste anymore. So now we're piling up with plastic waste, which really is not recyclable, even though they try to tell you it is. Um, very little of it gets recycled. So if you have a choice of, of glass or aluminum over plastic, take the glass or aluminum. So deconstruction. The deconstruction is where you fit, where someone comes in, a crew comes in, and they physically deconstruct the building. They dismantle it, and they take piece by piece apart, and they take all the nails out of the wood, and they um, recycle what they can't use, but they'll take it back, and they'll set it aside and have it as uh, to be used on a new building. So downcycling. Um, is where you, instead of recycling, so we're recycling aluminum cans, we're recycling glass, downcycling, you break it down into its component elements, but they have a lower value. So talk a little bit about concrete. Concrete is a mix of cement, aggregates, and water. Um, it's a, a chemical mix that you put the the water, the cement, and the aggregates together, it comes out in liquid form, as we all know, and then it hardens depending on, to different thicknesses of hardness, depending on what the mix of concrete is. So here's uh, a little graphic showing me, you know, we're at the quarry, we take the truck in there, we have to add limestone, shale, silica, um, old tires, and I can't read what that, FEX. And that goes into a kiln that's heated up and that and grinds down that gives us portland cement and cement is the component that we need to make concrete um, it has a high co2 level so it's not um, necessarily the best um, building material but it is the most widely used building material in the world um, and Look at this number, 5% of the worldwide generation of CO2 is due to cement production. So it's being in the building industry. The building industry uses, I think, is about 45% of the energy, um, either in the building or in the operation of the building. So you have great control over how this is going to play out over the next uh, couple decades. Aggregate is basically crushed stone or gravel. That's a, a big part of the cement mixture. And you can have different components of, from very fine aggregate to, to rougher aggregate. And then water is the critical component because it sets off a chemical reaction with the cement that bonds the cement to the aggregate and then it hardens through the chemical reaction and creates the cement that we're looking for. So here's a graphic with cement production and concrete production. You're probably used to the trucks just coming with the cement, turning around and bringing you the cement as they're turning. Um, this is, uh, but this is the process that goes into it before then. So when you order a, a truck with cement, you just don't say, bring me some cement. You have to tell them, um, do I want quick drying cement? Do I want extra uh, stabilizers in there? Is there a certain type of aggregate I want in there? Uh, do I want something that will because um, it's really hot out that will be very slow drying. So you, when you order the cement, you, there's a lot of information that you have to give them. So why is concrete such a great building material? Because it can be formed into almost any shape. It's cheap, strong, and it's durable, and it has high compressive strength. That means that when it uh, gets pushed on or pushed against, it's very strong. It has very little tensile, tensile strength or your strength when you're getting this one is the shear strength you have a force pushing in opposite directions at opposite sides so to counteract that we put rebar reinforcing bar into the cement here is a residential uh, foundation going in i think this is my neighborhood my husband's always walking around taking pictures of what people are building so concrete is naturally occurring you have, you're coring the materials but it's non-renewable it has a high embodied energy, although it has a durable, long service life, and it can be downcycled. So this is, we're br breaking it down, we're taking the rebar out, and we're using the aggregate for new concrete. You'll see that a lot when you see them doing major road work. 
if you follow the road work, it's kind of interesting to see the process because you'll see them tearing up the road and you'll see piles off to the site where they are, are recycling or downcycling the material that was in the road. So um, all that stuff used to go into garbage dumps. So it's good to see. So wood is a renewable resource. Um, trees absorb carbon dioxide when they're growing. So the carbon dioxide, the excess carbon dioxide, is what's causing us with the greenhouse gases, partly because we're tearing down forests and, and we're burning oil, et cetera. A lot of reasons behind it. So if you can, anywhere, plant a tree. Um, and then they have embodied energy. They have carbon sequestration. They're holding carbon in the ground. And um, they're good for the environment. So plant trees wherever you can. So forestry is the science or practice of managing trees. This looks like a clear cut area here. And clear cut means they just cut every tree down in the whole area. And this is something that, that uh, forestry companies love to do because just big, this, bring this big equipment in, clear cut all these trees, and then go out of there. Well, the problem with that is that um, you have soil erosion, you lose habitat for animals, um, then they replant these with the same kind of trees. It ends up being what's called a monoculture, where everything, all the, everything growing there is the same thing, which is not good for the environment or for the for the area. Um, a monoculture that you might be familiar with. If you guys ever heard of uh, Dutch elm disease? So in the 40s and 50s, cities all around the U.S. decided to plant elm trees because they're beautiful. They're big. You get these great overarching arcs across the street. They would shade well. They grew nicely, did well in urban areas. And then we got this Dutch elm disease. And because every tree in, in many communities was an elm tree, they lost all their trees. And Oak Park managed it, but they, I can remember our block used to be all elm trees. So that was a monoculture of trees. And so when one gets sick, they all go down. So now they mandate that uh, only there have to be a certain number of variety of trees on the same block so that they don't ever, so that when another disease comes through, they don't lose an entire block of trees. So we talked a little bit earlier about sustainable forestry. Um, so wood is a, is a um, renewable resource if it's done correctly. Um, in, you wouldn't harvest a whole area, you'd harvest sections of the area. You'd replant lots of trees for every tree that you took down because uh, depending on the tree type, hardwoods take a lot longer to grow than a softwood. So softwoods are, are the coniferous trees. Um, coniferous trees are trees that have needles. They don't lose their leaves. Deciduous trees are trees that lose their leaves. So coniferous trees are the pines. So they're after growing. That's what we use for studs in the building, et cetera. And the hardwoods, which we like as our finished trim materials, those are much slower growing and those are deciduous trees. Here's the Forest Stewardship Council, FSC. This is what you want to look for when you buy anything that's made out of wood. Is the wood that's used in there FS, FSC certified? Um, and their vision is to meet our current needs for future products without compromising the health of the world's forests for future generations. Because we need to think about our future generations there is a group called Seven Generations Ahead. Um, it was in Oak Park, and there's uh, other people have used this name. And it comes from an Indian proverb that you need to treat the environment for seven generations ahead. So whatever you do to the environment, you need to think about seven generations of your children later and how it will impact them. So here's another slide on certified wood. Types of trees, I just talked about this. Conifers are the pine trees. Deciduous are the tree with, with leaves that are turning beautiful colors right now. So in the winter, <clears throat> you've got greenery in the winter. So conifers work really good as a, a wind barrier when you're, um, when they, in the winter, because they don't lose their leaves and you can create great wind barriers with conifers. Deciduous trees are great for um, if you're doing a solar project because in the summer, they'll shade your house, and you've got these great glass overhangs. And in the winter, they've lost their leaves, and you get the sun in when you want the sun in. 
So there's lots of ways to use nature to, to help your design. We talked about hardwoods and softwoods. <clears throat> Dimensional lumber. I'm going to, uh, some people who are in my 108 class know that I, I stress this and I will be um, stressing it in every class. So lumber is cut to size, a uh, two by four is cut two by four inches. That's the nominal size. The dress size or the finish size is what it ends up being after shrinkage. So a two by four is not two inches by four inches. It's one and a half by three and a half. A two by 10 is one and a half by nine and a quarter. If you have a really old house, like my house is 110 years old, the two by fours in there are real two by fours because they were cut to be two by four after they dried. And also the wood is, is older growth wood because they were cutting down old growth forests. So remember, you should always know this, a two by four is not a two, is not two by four, it's one and a half by three and a half. And this is a chart that you should always have in your mind. <clears throat> we can also use engineered lumber. Uh, so what engineered lumber does is it takes a solid piece of wood at the top and then it takes these fiber boards in the middle. And so you can create these joists, so these are called uh, TJI joists, and, and you've got this strong member that can span a long distance. It's getting harder and harder to find wood joists that would be deep enough for so the joist holds the floor framing um, or the ceiling framing that would be deep enough to get the spans we want. The other nice thing about these is you can tell the, um, the manufacturer will tell you where you can cut holes in it for plumbing and mechanical, et cetera. And they'll tell you how far apart they have to be in this, in this web area. They're using different, they're using scrap material to um, put this together. OSB, oriented strand board, that's what this is. So wood as a building material is renewable. It has no embodied energy. It sequesters carbon from the atmosphere, takes that CO2 from the atmosphere, durable, long life. It can be reused and it can be recycled. So recycled would be making that composite, uh, making this OSB and uh, reused would be um, deconstructing and using it in a new building. But it has downsides, right? If, you have if you're in a termite area, this is termite damage. This is water damage. Water is like the thing you have to worry the most about in a building. There's water damage too from a gutter. You've really got to watch what's happening with the water in, in your space because it can really ruin and cause a lot of structural damage too. So wood is a great material, but you have to worry about how you keep the water away from it. Our next material is brick. I'm going to skip that site. Brick is naturally occurring because you're pulling clay out of the ground. It's often local, so you'll see brick colors in Chicago are different than the brick colors out west because they're using local clay and um, a lot of brick manufacturers are in northern Indiana. It is non-renewable, but it is reusable and it has a really long service life. It does have a high embodied energy because you're firing the bricks, but you can reuse them. Um, and lots of times people like the older brick, especially the old common brick that's in the in Chicago. It gets bought up and shipped to places like Texas for shopping malls and stuff. <clears throat> if it can't be reused, it can be it can be downcycled into aggregate too. So concrete block CMU, concrete masonry unit. That's another thing to remember. Concrete block is um, made with concrete into forms. It, it uh, uses the limestone and aggregates, has a high embodied energy. It is inexpensive and long live lived. You can get it with a variety of textures and finishes. You can get some that have a really nice finish on the outside. So it's a common building material. These are different sizes of CMU. Gypsum board is drywall. So it's an industrial product, two layers of heavy paper with uh, 
thin layer of gypsum. You can get gypsum board as thin as one quarter inch thick, one half, five eighths. Five eighths is the normal in residential because it meets a two hour fire rating. Um, it, you have mining for the gypsum. It's common, it's inexpensive. So here's the operation for gypsum manufacturing there. Bringing the raw materials in, it goes through a process to make the gypsum plaster that goes between two rolls of paper. When it comes out, it's cut to sheet size and then loaded onto a truck. Several years ago, there was a drywall shortage in the US. I want to say it was when um, the Iraq war started and there wasn't enough drywall. All the drywall was shipped over for use in Iraq and they um, there was a shortage. So some importers went to China and started importing drywall from China and their whole houses where they had to just literally gut them because people were getting so sick from them. And I don't know if they ever figured out exactly what was in them, but <clears throat> there were a lot of problems. So you want to know where your stuff comes from, where your materials manufactured, because we have stricter manufacturing guidelines and environmental health guidelines in the US than um, if you get something from China. So here's uh, drywall going up. You've probably all seen this. This is tape. So here's one section of drywall, here's another section, and you have to tape between it and then put a thin coat of uh, gypsum on it. It is recyclable. If you have a building built before 78, there's probably asbestos in the compound, so you can't recycle that. Asbestos is, um, is a mineral fiber that was used extensively in the building industry. It used to be considered the wonder material until people started dying from horrible lung cancers because asbestos the the fibers um, break apart into really small groups and they can be inhaled and um, you, they end up piercing your lungs so you want to avoid asbestos used to be outlawed and it's not anymore was uh, allowed to be brought back into the US about three years ago so you want to be careful so steel um, you don't see steel much in residential buildings, has a high embodied energy. It's durable, lasts very long, um, and it's recyclable. You will use the rebar. This is a photo of a rebar to add strength to concrete. Here's a steel beam. Sometimes in residential, you'll see these in the basement supporting the, uh, the first floor. Um, there's two kinds. An S section has a curve on it, and the W section has a straight edge but it can go longer distances for heavier loads. See it more in commercial buildings. And stone is another material. Naturally occurring, can be locally available. Um, there are environmental impacts to the quarrying and um, there are issues with um, the health and safety of the people quarrying, but stone is a good long use, long and, long lasting and durable material and it is reusable. So here's some different stone products, marble, there's different kinds of granites, there's uh, stone cut into face stones that you can use on a building. And here's different, here's again marble sink, granite countertops, we've got stone lintels and sills in this brick building and here's an all stone building. And ceramic is another one. It's similar process to brick. And you think of your ceramic tiles in your bathroom. That's the most, most place you'll see it. Durable, long service life. You can reuse them. They're not renewable though. So here's ceramic in a bathroom, kitchen, and a floor. I don't recommend ever doing a ceramic floor in a kitchen because everything you drop on it will break and the tiles will break and it hurts your knees after a while. It's a really hard surface to work on. So rapidly renewable materials, we talked a little bit about that already. Linoleum, this is all made, this is true linoleum. Uh, the um, company that is, I'm trying to think of the company, I'm, that is, uh, makes this, so this is a lot of linoleum, the cheaper linoleum just has color on the top. So if you nick it, you see the, the substrate below. This is the same all the way through and I'm spacing on the name of the company that does this. Cork is a renewable material, bamboo plywood, and then this is wheatgrass panel. So you can use these for countertops and they're actually 
pretty nice. And it's made out of wheatgrass and, and that's a renewable material. Straw bale, you could make a house out of straw bales. This is a, one option. Adobe is a great material. Adobe is essentially dried uh, mud brick taken from locally and mixed up to create uh, blocks. And then often they're skim coated. When that's done, it can go right back into the earth. So if I have um, some other locally sourced materials of rammed earth, this is a beautiful material. We don't see it around here because it doesn't do well with our climate, but you'd see it in the Southwest, really popular in Australia. They're essentially doing, they're putting dirt in, not dirt. It's a, a special, they have to test the, the soil. It needs to have a lot of clay in it. And then they're essentially using hydraulic presses to push it down and you get this gray styration of it. So rammed earth is an interesting material. So we talked about some of this already to be sustainable, build smaller, use less. When you build smaller, you use less materials. You can use less materials and higher quality materials and get a better environment. Um, use less, but use higher quality. Use something that's going to last for a long time. Design for a long service life, have flexibility into the spaces, avoid toxic materials and substances, Renovate rather than demolish. This country loves to demolish buildings. In Europe, they don't demolish buildings. You know, we, we give a hospital 20 years and we tear it down. In Europe, there are hospitals that are over 100 years old and they just renovate them. They reuse their old buildings. Um, adaptive reuse is giving a new function. So instead of just renovating the old hospital, um, if you drive towards Chicago on, on the freeway, on the right-hand side, there's the old Stroger Hospital. And that was a, um, a historic building. It was on National Register of Historic Places, and it was under danger of demolition because they didn't want it as a hospital anymore. Said it didn't work. So they did what was called adaptive reuse. It's now apartments, offices, uh, clinics, and they did a beautiful job. It's a gorgeous building. Another huge adaptive reuse, I think it's the largest adaptive reuse in the country, maybe the world, is the old post office. When you take 290 to go to downtown, you go under a building. That was the old U.S. Post Office, and it was built when uh, Sears and Roebuck and um, uh, Montgomery Ward and Spiegel, those were all big mail order companies. They were bigger than Amazon. They were situated in Chicago, and they would just, they would send out, you know, car load, train car loads of uh, material every day. And so the post office was large to handle that volume. You want to use locally resource source materials and you want to recycle or reuse materials wherever you can. You want to avoid toxic materials both for your health and for polluting the environment and for the health of the people who are going to live in that in that in that or work in that space. And here's a red list, a toxic red list. You know, this asbestos right there. Um, so you want to really think about the materials and when you specify something, what's behind that? And there are different companies that rate materials and, and their pre-cycling, the practice of avoiding acquisition of unnecessary items. So limiting purchase of things to things that you really, really need or delaying purchases that aren't urgently needed. Buy in bulk and avoid extra packaging. Um, our food co-op, we buy in bulk and we don't, um, I take my own jars and, and we don't have all that wasteful packaging and buying products that will last. Um, I know people love Ikea. My son had an Ikea desk year and a half and it's trash. And so now he's got to get a new desk. Sharing items rather than buying individual. If you can have a cooperative in your neighborhood of sharing items. I, I don't understand why we all have a lawnmower. We all have a big extension ladder. We all have all these things. I wish that there was a corner storage cabinet that we could all go to and, and share from. There are some libraries that are doing some of this stuff, uh, you know, sharing tools and sewing machines and stuff, but it's not um, really prevalent. So just have an informed decision about what you're putting into your building, about what you're doing with your own life. You know, when you buy clothes, are they clothes that are that are going to last 
through a long time, or is it something that's really trendy that I'm not going to be able to use in the next year? So you want to think about uh, buildings and making sure that you're considering both the current and the future use. So are there any questions on that? Okay, 